I had the privilege of chairing a, a commission whose members were largely political and policy leaders from developing countries. They had spent a good part of their lives struggling with the challenge of uh, achieving sustainable growth and poverty reduction in their countries. And um, I learned a tremendous amount from them uh, about that process. And um, when, when I wrote the book, I, I really wrote it for two reasons. One was to, to share some of that learning about uh, the process of growth and development, but also to take note of the fact that, that this is a really a, an important change in the pattern globally. Uh, you know, for the 200 years before and up through World War II, basically the, what we now think of as the industrialized countries were growing and the rest weren't. And, and so we have a, a complete change in the pattern, uh, which I characterize as a century-long pattern of convergence in which the, the, the developing countries you know, grow at relatively high rates and eventually sort of catch up with us, at least a large fraction of them. Probably 15% of the world's population was well-to-do on balance in 1950, and by 2050, at the end of that century, it will probably be closer to 80 to 85 percent or maybe more. It's just a very different world. And, of course, the, the other thing I was concerned to, to try to talk about is that after about 60 years of this kind of growth, the, the developing countries, especially the big emerging economies, are becoming extremely important and impactful in the global economy. And I wanted to talk about some of the opportunities and challenges that that created as well. You know, the growth is important if it's sustained for a long time because it produces just massive shifts in people's uh, material well-being, but much more importantly in, in their opportunities. They don't struggle with, you know, daily life and keeping themselves and their family alive and instead have opportunities to be productive um, to think their children and grandchildren will be better off than they are, to be creative, um, to do all the things that I think really matter to human beings, to be in a certain in certain dimensions at least free, uh, and and so th th it really isn't growth so much as that's important, except as an enabler of those mo more fundamental things. Um, you know, sustaining high growth is is has you know, it's, it's a subject that we still, you know, sort of try to understand. I think the experience of the last 15 or 20 years uh, in developing countries plus some excellent, you know, academic and, and policy research has made our understanding better than it was. But, of course, you know, uh, uh, some kind of, you know, good governance is crucial. Um, it's not really just about economics. You know, a country... Uh, that's poorly governed, not just in form, but in, in intent, is, is, will never really grow. Um, there's, there's lots of versions of, of those pathologies, and they occur in autocratic systems and in democratic ones, too, we now know. Um, so I would say that's probably at the top of the list. It's a, it's a government that's reasonably competent, that is trying to, to pursue what an economist would call a right model, which is a kind of open, a sophisticated open economy model, but, but really a government whose intent is to try to make the, the lives of the people in the country, virtually everyone, better off over time. And, and you know, with those, with those critical conditions, you know, I mean, I think the rest of the story is, is, is largely economic, but that's important. Yeah, it, it's different in magnitude. You know, the the British uh, after the British Industrial Revolution, probably the average rate of growth in real terms, um, real per capita terms, was probably one and a half percent. And then continental Europe and eventually United States and Canada and you know the European offshoots um, probably were up around two and a half percent too. <clears throat> And, and the, the developing countries, when they hit high-speed growth, are in the 7 to 10 percent range. So that's just completely different. Um, then the, I think the fundamental reason is that once the, the basic conditions um, were in place, you know, the removal of the constraints of colonialism and so on, then the, 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 gap, the gap between these countries and the, and the advanced countries in terms of the knowledge and technology base of the economy had become so large 
that when they get when the when the catch up process started, as long as it's working, it produces extremely rapid um, increases in potential um, output for an economy, um, just by virtue of the knowledge transfer process. I mean, one of the things we've learned in the last 50 years is that growth ultimately is dependent on the knowledge and technology base of an economy. And so what's really happening in, in, in its shortest version is these economies are increasing their natural, the, the, you know, the, the, the knowledge and technology underpinnings of their economy by essentially learning from the rest of the world, in particular the advanced countries, at a very high rate of speed. So the other crucial yeah, ingredient is that, that a, a, a relatively poor developing country that's just starting the process has has demand on the demand side of the economy is relatively small and and without m making it sound pejorative relatively uninteresting most of it is you know food housing and a bit of energy and whatnot and what the global economy gives you on is sort of item two item one is knowledge uh, that's been accumulated over two decades or i mean two centuries or more and item two is a huge market that you can sell in. So no matter how fast you grow, you really never influence global prices for things. So once you find something that you can compete in, you can expand in that area for quite a long time before something starts to cut it off. You know, whereas a, a large, and the only exception to that is, is illustrative, is that China finally got big enough in the areas in the tradable sector of their economy where they were exporting a lot that their market share was so large that they actually were able to affect prices in a way that that um, that would slow them down in particular the united kingdom bootstrapped this basically generating their own demand largely they did have colonial empires so there was a where's the flow of trade that helped accelerate both the increase in incomes and wealth um, in a very asymmetric fashion, so it wasn't quite standalone, but but it was cl much closer. And similarly, on the knowledge side, you know, the continental Europe and the United States had the had the UK to rely on, and eventually we all, of course, all rely on each other. Um, and but but still, we were basically collectively generating the demand side of the economy that we needed to rely on. Whereas whereas in the post-war period, the developing countries are really in the early stages of growth, um, for much of this period, we're re relying on the, what was relatively huge advanced country demand. Now, of course, the, the developing countries are heavily dependent on China because of the size of the demands. So it's it it it, it the, which illustrates the point that it's not really just that the country's advanced, but that, that it's big. A developing country doesn't determine the external environment. So. So in the post-war period, um, starting very soon after World War II, the global economy was systematically opened up through successive uh, rounds of negotiations in the GATT. Um, and people will debate what the intent of that was, but the effect was on an increasingly wide range of products and services, the global economy was opened uh, in such a way that countries that you know, could find a way to compete um, were able to access the global market's knowledge and demand. So, and, and of course, there was a huge boost from technology, from, te from you know, information and communications technology on the one hand and, and transportation and logistics on the other, so, which, which clearly increases the, the, the extent of integration of the global economy. I mean, you know, technologically, uh, 30 years ago, uh, you know, you didn't deliver services at a distance, you know, using the internet and information and communications technology, and now you do. So, and that's not a policy decision, that's a technological issue. So, the, so the external conditions were, and, and, and of course, I mean, the, you know, the removal of the colonial constraints when the colonial empires collapsed, uh, you know, what was terribly important, even if it created new nations with lots of challenges in, in terms of creating national identity. So, so there's a part that developing countries don't get to do, you know, which determines the, the uh, friendliness and supportiveness of the external environment. And that, that all went by on balance. I mean, there's lots of challenges, but on balance, that went very well in the post-war period and much better than at any other point in history. And with that, then the externally oriented strategies 
of a developing country are probably in order of importance access external you know knowledge and technology and know how um, access external um, markets you know uh, and those two are linked I mean the, a developing country will extern access external markets by for example, having multinational companies engage in foreign direct investment and bringing with them not only knowledge of production technology, but knowledge of the global supply chain. Global supply chains were starting to develop uh, before, you know, the, the powerful effect of the Internet came on. But, you know, they were relatively hard to manage. They were inefficient. They took a long time to get organized. You know, it used to be said that, you know, to, to get a, a new product designed and in production in, a, in the context of a global supply chain in, in certain industries would, you know, take you sort of 18 months to two years, which is a long time when you're trying to meet the needs of a rapidly moving market. You know, that, that would probably, that number would probably be down to six months now. So, and that is, that's enabled by increasing expertise and the integration through the information and technology. So, so I, I, the way I think of it is information technology increasingly made global supply chains fast and efficient. One huge challenge, you know, we thought probably 10 or 15 years ago was the infrastructure, and that problem seems to be solved, being solved. You know, there's a huge, powerful um, high bandwidth uh, fiber optic cable going down the, um, the eastern side of Africa which, you know, vastly increases the sort of the bandwidth of their external connection to the rest of the world through the Internet and, and, um, and video and, and, and telephones and so on. And the second thing that, you know, turned out to be a near miracle was that the cell phone technology, which is much less capital intensive and, afford, and is therefore much more affordable than landline technology, Operating really with just private sector incentives and competition has, has, has started to connect, you know, practically everybody in the world uh, through its data capabilities and, and a marvelous array of information and transaction and financial services is starting to be delivered using these little tiny devices. So, so I would say a, a reasonable guess is that, that whatever gaps there have been, and they were very large, in the first half century of sort of high-speed growth will, will diminish dramatically in terms of connectedness and communication and so on. There are lots of examples of, you know, government trying to do too much. I mean, the centrally planned economies um, all failed. Um, it's pretty clear, I think, you know, now that we've had the experience of 60 years of experiments in this, that uh, that you can't live without some version of the market system with prices, decentralization, incentives, you know, uh, and enough definition of private property that people are willing to invest, um, thinking that they actually own the things that they invest in. And so at some, at some level, a basic market system is right, and governments that we're trying to do too much of what the private sector, the market aspect does, you know, generally had problems or even just failed completely. So an aspect of this on one side was, was the abandonment of those centrally planned things and the withdrawal. Um, a friend of mine in India said, uh, you know, I mean, reform has two parts, you know, when you're trying to kind of reconfigure things to achieve this kind of sustained high growth. And the first one is getting the government to stop doing things it shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so that, so there's that side. On the other hand, you know, the, the, the notion that government should do as little as possible, uh, you know, and get, and try to get the private sector to do, you know, virtually everything, uh, you know, maybe a kind of, uh, viable strategy, uh, you know, for an advanced country, although, frankly, most advanced countries don't even do it themselves, but it's definitely not a workable strategy for developing countries. So, so I think, you know, part of the process of achieving this kind of sustained growth is finding the right complementary role for government. So that I think it's right to say that the government's role 
is to support in a variety of ways through policies and investment the um, the private sector, in particular the investment dynamics that go with the private sector, which is where the growth and the employment, the incremental employment comes from, and ultimately the poverty reduction. But that complementary role turns out to be very important. Uh, and one element of it is is investment, you know, in, in what are sometimes called public goods, but they're or partly public goods, the infrastructure uh, of a variety of kinds in education, human capital, you know, turn out to be probably the two central items. And and when governments fall short on that, you know, that the, the growth does not get to these high levels. Um, so we talked a fair amount about that. Probably is in developing countries and in, and, and in developed countries, the role of government, you know, not only can be, but probably should be different. But 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 the slightly more intertemporal version of that is that the role of government in, in a developing country over this multi-decade journey from, you know, wherever it starts, usually relatively poor and not growing, to the end, which is a relatively high-income country, that role of government changes more or less continuously. Um, and it's particular. so, and the reason I think it's fairly easy to understand, that, you know, in a developing country, the not only the governmental institutions are not fully formed, but the market institutions and capabilities are not fully formed either. And so it's a very pragmatic sort of, you know, get the job done division of labor that seems to occur when, when this works. I mean, one way I try to describe it to, to people is to think about China in 1978 when it abandoned the centrally planned system under Deng Xiaoping and decided to at least allow elements of a market system to work. And, and you know, China at that point had, a, had a, an economy in which the government had been dominant, and while the market institutions and capabilities were probably nascent, um, they certainly didn't exist. And so this is, this is an economy that's been, by their own account, in transition for, you know, at least 30 years. And, the, and it's clear that the role of government is, is, has shifted. You know, the government had to do things um, that they probably don't have to do now. And for, I mean, a very simple example, in the, in the early days, um, the market system clearly worked. The market incentives in agriculture had a stunning effect on output. But, uh, but if the government, you know, or the central bank, with whatever capabilities it had, it had tried to slow economic activity down if, it, if the economy got overheated by raising the interest rate. So, frankly, nobody cared what the interest rates were. <laughs> that wasn't the way the economy worked. So something that we simply take for granted in advanced countries, which is that, you know, the central bank will raise the interest rates and that will reduce inflation and, and slow the economy down and prevent overheating, was simply probably not true in 1980 in China. And so they had to use other means for both stimulating and slowing the economy down. Similarly, in the mid, in, in economies go through a transition uh, that I try to talk about in the book, um, which is very important and very difficult, called the middle income transition. It's basically trying trying to sustain growth when you get to about four to four to five thousand dollars of income, and you're not really competitive in the things that you know you used to export before, and so on. And and what we understand about that transition is there's a major change in the role of government. Um, its interventions in the economy become less targeted, and they become much more like the way an advanced country government supports its market economy. This is, in, in some ways, is, is, both, is the most interesting and also the hardest part of all this for people. We all, um, we all try to think about the way the world works in, in, in somewhat static terms, whereas this is something that's in constant motion. And it's not just constant motion, but it's not cyclic constant motion. It's not repetitive constant motion. It's changing sort of, you know, in, on a one-way journey. And that applies to, to the developing countries. Now that their impact on us is fairly large, it applies, I think, to the advanced countries. This is the subject I'm focused on now. And it, and it applies to the management of the global economy as well, um, where, where we have lots of challenges because of the way we used to manage it, which was that... Uh, the, you know, the advanced countries made the rules and, and we all had similar sorts of interests and we were pretty generous about it, I, I have to say. So we didn't make rules just for us. Uh, 
and and now that's just not going to work uh, because you know we've got the developing countries you know within a decade or less of being over half the global economy. I, I sometimes say in developing countries that you know I've spent a fair amount of time in China, um, learning, watching, learning, trying to be helpful, and so on. That the biggest mistake that gets made over and over again is to find a successful formula. Assume the world, you know, will allow you to do it forever, and then and then just do it for too long. That you know we're living in a world of constant change. We have to be pragmatic about it. We have to adapt. We have to protect people. You know, when the transitions come and and they uh, and they get sideswiped and so on, we have to we have to solve problems basically. And, you know, when I thought about it, having spent a little time in and around the business world, I thought to myself, this is very much a business attitude. You know, in businesses and dynamic industries don't think, you know, in cyclical terms, they think, you know, there's constant challenges. There's a challenge of innovation and staying ahead. There's a challenge of adapting to change and so on. And in some ways, I think, you know, the, challenge, the, the issue is just to have that kind of attitude that's appropriate to that environment transplanted <laughs> to a, a much larger universe in which includes policymakers and the, and the way we run economies as well. In a, in a number of countries, including the one that I'm a citizen of, I live in Italy, as you know, part of the year, and, and in the United States part of the year, uh, I'm an American citizen, and I think we're wrestling with this now. Uh, you know, we were we we're an economy that was dominant after World War II because of the destruction that world, the war caused in a number of other places. We are less dominant now because Europe is this powerful force and Japan has risen and, and we've enjoyed that. And we're going to become less dominant in the future as the world's future economic giants, you know, take their place on the on the global economy stage. But I think we're right now, you know, we're. We're at a crossroads in the global economy in the United States and the other advanced countries when the emerging economies, because of their size and their increasing incomes and capabilities, are, are presenting challenges to us. And at least thus far, I don't think we're, you know, in terms of mindset and frameworks, we're not adapting very well. We're not even thinking about it very carefully. It's one of the reasons I wrote the book, as I thought, you know, it's it's, it's probably important for us to understand these very powerful global forces and, 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 and how they're shifting, you know, the parameters within which we all, we all operate. When, if I go back in time, you know, I, I remember I told a story in the book of, you know, when Deng Xiaoping asked the World Bank to come in the early 1980s to China, and he sat the McNamara, who was the president of the World Bank at the time, and two others, uh, both of whom I know, um, down and he said, you know, we're going to try a different way of managing this economy and reducing poverty and uh, and so on. And he said, you know, you're a bank, but we don't really want money. Um, what we need is knowledge. And, um, and so his request was that they set up a process by which knowledge of ec economic management uh, that had been developed in the advanced countries over a couple of uh, centuries or more, you know, was transplanted to China. And I think it's interesting. I mean, you know, that the that the the person responsible for the major change in direction in China was spectacular sort of economic results over the last 30 years. The first the first and maybe almost the only thing he asked for was high speed knowledge transfer. The business world, you know, in all of our countries uh, has very dynamic elements and adapts continuously. So, uh, so I don't think the problem is there. I mean, in the American economy, there's very innovative sectors. They're highly competitive in the global tradable, tradable part of the the economy, the parts where we interact. Um, the same is true in France. Germany's doing very well. A number of other countries have to lift their game on this front. Um, you know, I, I, there are distributional issues. I think in, in you know, the, the contrast between Germany and the United States is interesting. Germany seems to have adapted with a combination of private sector initiative and dynamics and pretty sensible sort of policies worked out with government, business, and labor as participants so that the benefits of the economic growth and dynamism are bro fairly broadly shared 
in the economy, whereas in the United States, the middle class is really not doing very well. We have an employment challenge and we have an income distribution challenge as well. And without pretending to know all of what that's about, I think we're, our, our, our policy frameworks and the way we sort of think of the options for adapting are n need some change in order to, to make a go of, of, of the global economy as we now experience it, you know, 60 years from the start of this century of convergence. John Williamson, you know, is credited with the Washington Consensus produced at the end of the 1980s. It, 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 it's, it's, it's come to have a bad name, I think, somewhat unfairly. If you, if you read the main elements of the Washington Consensus and ask, do these correspond reasonably well to what we now understand to be very important ingredients on the sort of economics and regulatory side of high-speed, you know, sustained growth and development. The answer is yes, they do. Um, there were two ways, I think, in which, you know, John's insights uh, were misused. One, one was to think of this as a kind of formula. You know, if you do these things, everything will be fine as opposed to some important necessary conditions, but probably not sufficient. And so what, what got lost in part was the process, you know, the, pro the constant adapting and problem solving process that, that you just described very well a minute ago. And, and, and then the second and more serious, I think, was that, that, that it was misinterpreted in a very stripped down form um, as small government is, uh, is is the best, the smallest you can make it, you know, strip down to things that only government can do, privatize everything else, open up your economy more or less overnight, uh, you know, ignoring all the subtleties of the sort of transitions that need to occur uh, and so on. And, and I think that version of it, which people associate with at least some of the countries in Latin America at that period of time, seems to have been much less successful. I mean, there are people who don't agree with that. There are people who say that the Washington consensus is fine and where it didn't work was where it wasn't implemented completely. Um, and I'm not sure we'll ever settle that issue. Uh, but but, but my, my view, for what it's worth, looking at the countries that, you know, had this pragmatic, experimental, sort of evolving role of government view of the matter, you know, but with with sensible guidelines that, that looked very much like uh, John Williams' original list um, were the ones that tended to succeed. On balance, I think the Beijing consensus will not be a concept that you know that, that lives with this. Every country is idiosyncratic, but but China's growth dynamics, uh, you know, are essentially consistent with their predecessors. You know, with Japan and Korea and Taiwan and even little Botswana. And so on. So, and a number of other countries in Asia and other parts of the world. So, uh, I don't think, at least yet, uh, we can say that you know there's a there's a kind of new model that was invented in China. You know, they. I mean, I think they've contributed mightily through their experience to learning about this, and those lessons um, are important and and are worthy of study on a broader front as they are in other countries. But China's China's very interesting because it has never been tried at this scale before. Uh, you know, 1.3 billion people in an economy that's going to be someday 20% of the global economy. It's just different. But now there isn't there is an issue coming up in China, which is some which is sometimes confused with this question of whether they've invented a new growth model, which is the the role of the state, I think, in economic terms, has, you know, in the past 60 years, has demonstrated both the failures and the successes of doing things the wrong way up until 1978 or 9, and then the right way, and 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 it fits the description in the period where it was successful, the last 31 years, of being a sort of, you know, whatever the ideology, it's a it's a pragmatic, you know. Um, it's, it, it's based on reasonable economic principles, uh, but it, those are combined with a kind of pragmatic problem-solving approach and a very, very, in the case of China, high level of saving and investment. Um, you know, China is extraordinary. It's a complete outlier on this front. I mean, the, the other high-growth countries saved and invested at high rates, but, not, but China's just kind of 
up on the right end of that distribution. But going forward, there's an issue about whether or not China's governance structure with a dominant party in the middle of it um, will be consistent with the future evolution of their economy. And I think that's a question that the Chinese ask, you know, not not too loudly internally, but um, but and is asked outside as well. So we, we know that the political and governance structures of countries tend to evolve along with the economy that, that Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and probably others were dominant single party versions of a democracy that evolved into full multi-party democracies in the sense we understand it, you know, where one side can actually lose the election. Um, and w in China doesn't have that structure. It is evolving, but, but none of us knows, I think, including the Chinese, where this, where this uh, particular form of governance is going to end up. Most of these countries, in one form or another, had a fairly powerful planning function. It's funny when I talk about the emerging economies in, you know, in the advanced or industrialized economies, I frequently get questions, well, how can a planned economy grow that fast? And I sort of hit my head and laugh and say, I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, after the planning period was over, you know, in the sense of a complete economic plan, they, they kept, but China and India and a number of others kept the word plan. But the, but the plan now in China or India is more like the French indicative plan, you know, of a number of decades ago where you basically set priorities and kind of create a shared sense of where everything was going to go as a way of coordinating economic activity. And, and I think that's more like what the plan is now in China. And and it's and it's it but it's very important. I mean, in, in in countries like that, there's a pretty good understanding of what's supposed to happen and why it all fits together. Its internal logic is important, and then it's shared very widely. You know, so that so that for example, businesses know what direction policy is going to go. And I think you know, to be perfectly honest, I think in the advanced countries we could use a little bit more of that. You know, in, in areas that have long time horizons, like sort of energy and environmental policies and so on. Europe does better than, than we do in America on that. But, but that, that's a, those are territories in which I think that kind of plan, you know, makes a lot of sense. And, and then once you have that, that's an important role of government. They have to draw in the labor side and the, and the business side and the, and the civil society organization side of the, of the structure um, and, and get it done. The other input to, to the later arrivals in the high growth category, including China, was the models and example of their predecessors was terribly important. And, and Japan was the first high growth, by these standards, the first high growth case ever. So, you know, Korea and Taiwan were very influenced by, by China. A number of other Asian countries were, and China was influenced by all of them. Uh, so the fact that they had previous models to look at and, and models in the sense, you know, we mean it, examples. Um, the demonstration effects are very important and I think accelerated the learning. Korea followed the Japan model relatively closely, including the reluctance to allow foreign direct investment, uh, you know, which was quite limited. So they found other ways. And the foreign direct investment is, is known to be a pretty powerful channel of um, of knowledge transfer. So if you don't have it, you have to find alternatives, and they and they did. China didn't follow that approach at all. It it, it privileged not all investment because there's still capital controls, but foreign direct investment really almost from the get go, and certainly by the 1990s, you know, when they had kind of fully opened up, they were relying heavily on the knowledge transfer associated with foreign direct investment. They protected certain parts of the economy in Japan so that their, the structures didn't evolve very much. That may have been politically necessary, but, but they've ended up with an economy that's a very, you know, it's not, it's not unique, but it, but it has this kind of structure where you have very, fairly, fairly, high, fairly high structural inefficiencies in part of it, and then sort of hyper-competitiveness in other parts. No, I mean, the reason I, you know, I think, Many of us are enthusiastic about these sort of general trends as they're, you know, uh, positively affecting the lives of literally hundreds of millions of people that we share the planet with. So that, I mean, that is in, at some very large scale level is something about what justice is, is all about. 
No, I, I think, you know, the, the, the distributional aspects of growth are, are slightly complicated, but very important. Um, you know, when if in a country where everybody's poor, um, you really can't achieve uh, anything without some growth. You can't you can't do it just by redistribution because there isn't enough to go around. Um, and as growth starts to occur, it produces a rise, usually produces some kind of rise in inequality measured in terms of income and, and in other ways. And it's, part of that's inevitable, but I think it's important to understand that that if you let it get out of hand, um, it's close to out of hand in China, um, maybe close to out of hand in the United States. Then, then it then it causes problems of you know social tensions and social unrest and political um, kind of instability as well. The 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 worst form is so that's one dimension of you know you're going to get inequality, but you have to manage it carefully and you and you have to uh, pay attention to it. The second is that in these high speed growth environments, you know, there's transitions occurring all the time. In particular, people lose their jobs. And, and so that notion that I think, you know, is, is dominant in Europe, that you have to protect people is a, is a very important one. You can't just let the market dynamics work themselves without the social and other safety nets, the access to basic services and whatnot when you happen to be a victim of this kind of high-speed machine running. And then there are good and bad ways to do that. One of the learnings in Europe is that you don't protect people very effectively in the long run by protecting companies and industries. Um, and it's better to try to protect people and families directly so you don't interfere with the uh, sort of global competitive dynamics. You can say that, you know, you're, you should try to protect people rather than jobs, but if the if the and developing countries wrestle with this all the time. If, if if you think of this in Schumpeterian terms, jobs are being created all the time and jobs are being destroyed all the time by competitive processes, both internally and with the global economy. And if the job destruction process gets out ahead of the job creation process, then you've got a major problem, you know, of economic performance and unemployment and 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 um, dashed hopes and expectations. So you'd have to modify what I just said and say you in another part of, of the equation you have to pay attention to is whether a job creation and job destruction are in reasonable match. And one of the one of the reasons countries don't open up in a kind of sudden fashion to the global economy is they're cautious and have to manage, you know, this rate of um, exposure to foreign competition of the domestic economy. And that, that's become, um, you know, standard practice now, but it involves judgment. There's no formula that tells you how to do that. So there's lots of, lots of tensions um, of that type, and now we're starting to experience them in the advanced countries. The, the, the most serious form of inequality, if you like, is exclusion, uh, is absence of equality of opportunity. That if there's a significant group of people in the economy, def defined whatever way you want, you know, by caste, by religion, by tribe, by, you know, even gender now, um, you know, that's excluded from the process, you know, something will go wrong. And it will usually be in the way they, it, there'll be a failure of support of the overall program. Uh, and so what, what, the Growth Commission felt extremely strongly about, and these are people with a lot more experience than I have, is that, in, that the, the inclusiveness in all these dimensions turns out to be just a crit critical aspect of long-term growth strategy. If you ignore it, something bad will happen, and it's usually, it's usually something that amounts to a failure or a loss of support for the policies and investments that support the growth, and then you stop. The most important, you know, sort of process that's been underway in terms of creating a kind of multinational economic and other social structure, of course, is the European Union. And that's not that's that's a process that has accomplished a huge amount, but encounters difficulties uh, along the way and requires uh, rethinking, reinventing leadership, you know, even going back to the drawing boards and asking if the original goals are are clearly right and 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 I think it's the honest answer is you know something similar um, is going to need to happen, and it'll be a very long term journey, probably the rest of the second half of this century of convergence uh, 
you know, where we develop the develop and 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 deepen the institutions that are needed for global governance. Right now, I think it's fair to say that interdependence in the economic sense has outrun the governance capabilities by a considerable margin, and and that that's an environment which is um, risky and volatile, uh, and has lots of problems with it. And and so you know, here we have the G20. It's inherited the sort of mantle from the G7, uh, G8 to be the kind of setter of priorities. It's a logical, it's not inclusive, you know, but we have the United Nations, the World Bank and the IMF that are more inclusive in terms of shareholders, but it's where 85 to 90% of the global economy lies. And it incur and it includes all the major, uh, virtually all the major emerging economies. So if the G20 can, learn over time how to build multinational policy coordination and consensus on things that really matter, that will be a huge step forward, but nobody knows, I don't think, how to do that. That's that's kind of what we're doing now. In in Europe or America, in slightly different ways, we've not really recovered from the crisis. So we, one of the effects of the crisis was, ca was to cause um, a very, fairly rapid increases in the sort of public sector debt and deficits and so on. That's and and in in Europe that takes the form of differences across countries and destabilizing problems in some of the smaller countries. Um, and in America, it, it takes the form of you know a big federal government deficit that needs to be reined in uh, by a sort of bipartisan plan that needs to get put together and both of those things are uncertain so it's not a pretty picture but nevertheless i think you know if you stand back you know we've kind of learned a lesson but at least there's a reasonable hope that we won't repeat exactly the same mistakes in the future there's an attempt um to to regulate the financial systems in a different way um and the emerging economies have you know emerged from the crisis in very good shape and restored pre-crisis levels of 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 debt, I, you know, I and others are a little bit schizophrenic about that. You can get it's sort of a question of whether the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, right? I get up some mornings and think, you know, we'll solve our problems in the advanced countries. You know, Japan will recover because it's a very resilient place, and the emerging economies have demonstrated, you know, a, a very resilient and enhanced capacity for um, withstanding shocks and restoring growth. And then other mornings I get up and think, you know, if China goes down, that'll take the rest of the, you know, the, the emerging economies down with it. It's so important. You know, the United States is running risks with its sovereign debt and ultimately the reserve currency, the main reserve currency. Europe's sort of stumbling around trying to figure out how to share the burden of bailing these countries out. And all these risks are sort of correlated with each other. And, you know, so if the, if, the, if, the, if the dominoes start falling, it could be a pretty ugly picture. And, you know, I just go back and forth on that. I, I, I guess I would say I'm cautiously optimistic, but, but there does seem to me an awful lot of risk right now in the global economy, systemic risk. There are similarities in the in the fundamental similarities in the in the technological and sort of economic forces that operate on all of our countries, um, but then there are some fairly important differences. I mean, I'll just give you one example. Um, after the ambulance goes by, um, that you know the uh, the American household sector got uh, leveraged up to a tremendous and dangerous extent. Um, in the in the course of the build up to the crisis, and that's part of the reason it's so difficult to recover, because the household balance sheet damage from asset price declines, in particular, this the continuing problems and fragility of the housing sector mean it's very difficult to get consumption back um, and domestic demand. Um, whereas in Italy, where I live, household leverage is extremely low, and the savings rate in the economy is extremely high. And so while there's lots of challenges at the level of, you know, sort of government debt, uh, the private sector, you know, is in a very different condition. And I think, it, you know, the short answer would be to understand these things, you know, it, you can do it by reading, but it's a little easier when you live in multiple places. I also, I, I spend quite a lot of time in the 
developing countries, um, continuing to learn, and and I find I find the perspectives that come from that are fair, quite interesting as well. I'm actually quite optimistic about India, and I'm also quite optimistic about Africa. Um, I tried to talk a little bit about the African countries in the context of the countries that had thus far had trouble starting the, the – um, I didn't talk about them explicitly. I, mean, you know, I talked about them as countries that were new, um, you know, trying to establish an identity. You know, in the case of Africa, many of these countries don't make any sense economically. They're just the leftover of dismantling colonial empires. Um, but the, but the, but the, and they have struggled mightily with both the governance issues and then um, economic challenges. But you know the performance in the last 15 to 20 years is is starting to look quite optimistic. I mean, the, the, many of these countries have young leaders who are very effective. Uh, they take responsibility as opposed to sort of blame somebody else. They don't want to be dependent on aid. Um, they understand, you know, at a very basic level what the what the sort of open economy growth dynamics are and know, you know, the components and what needs to be done. It doesn't make it less challenging, but the performance, you know, in terms of accelerated growth, both before the crisis and even now after the crisis is coming back, you know, makes one sort of cautiously optimistic. Um, and, you know, I think managing the natural resource wealth, which is extraordinary in Africa, effectively is going to be a key part of this. There's lots of people, I mean, I have a small part in an initiative called the Natural Resource Charter, um, which is uh, in some sense building on the work of the Extractive Industries um, um, Transparency Initiative. Uh, you know, basically in order to sort of help countries deal with what's a really a quite complicated problem, which is how do you handle soup to nuts, so to speak, the, the natural resource wealth and turn it into a sustainable pattern of growth. And, and so that's a kind of challenge that's a little bit more prevalent in, in much of Africa. But on the whole, you know, there's a reasonable chance that that you know, in the second half of the century that, that I tried to talk about in the book, Africa will be the star performer that people predicted it would be in the first half. Leadership changes that were unplanned and clear, clearly exogenous seem to have effects in some of the empirical work that's been, that's been done. But, you know, in a, at a common sense level, you know, the, the, the economies, you know, before they get started on the growth are in some kind of economic slash political equilibrium in which not much good is happening. And so the question, the fundamental question, and people characterize that in different ways, but I mean, however you characterize it, it's, it's a pattern in which there's not much growth. And, and so in a sort of simple economic terms, the, the challenge is to sort of change the sort of dynamic equilibrium you're in. And that usually in economic terms makes, means making a fairly big jump. You don't, you don't, don't, just don't inch away, you know, from where you are because in, in most sort of stable equilibria, if you inch away, you come back uh, to where you were. And so you need to jump a long way from where you are and really change the pattern. And which, which usually means changing behavior and changing people's minds and, uh, and, and changing the vision uh, you know, about how the whole thing's going to run. And that seems to me is a function of leadership. But when we, when I, when I use the term and when we did in the growth commission, we didn't mean just a single individual. Um, it's frequently a group. Uh, it, it, uh, you know, in, in most of these countries, we end, end up identifying a single individual and sometimes a single individual, you know, as in the case of, um, uh, Mandela is just enormously important. Uh, Though even there, you could say his colleagues in the African National Congress were important, but sometimes a single individual is just crucial, you know, by virtue of his sort of humanity and stature. But quite frequently, it's a group, you know, put together, and they. And, and the tricky part of this, of course, is how do they acquire enough power and control, you know, in a system that's already running, in order to be able to jumpstart this process, and the, and the pro, in, in some sense, leadership includes leadership when you're so-called out of office and uh, and you're trying to persuade people that there's a better way to do things. There's two ways this could go. Uh, 
the the good way is that we're going to have to invent and build the global governance institutions and that China and India and other countries, Brazil, uh, it's quite a long list, are going to be an important part of, of doing that jointly along with with the rest of us. And and we don't know exactly, you know, what we're going to build or how we're going to get there. I think it's a generation's work at least um, to do it. And nobody has a blueprint. Uh, nobody knows how to exactly balance national interests on the one hand with global interests on the other and how to institutionalize that in a way that works. I mean, we know where the starting point is the national interests are dominant, and it makes it very difficult um, to sort of achieve, uh, you know, global coordination, even when the benefits are pr fairly easy to to identify. Uh, but that doesn't mean so it's a hard problem. It's not impossible to solve. And the best hope in scenario one would be, you know, India and China with very different, you know, governance systems, but probably a fundamental shared understanding that we all have a collective interest in this enterprise, the global economy, and its sustainability and so on, and will participate in in governing it. And they'll have very important roles. I mean, in a few, you know, 20 or 30 years, these will be the two economic giants, if everything goes well. Um, the, the second scenario is when they get to that point, they'll A, disagree with each other, or B, have very different models, and something bad will happen. The global economy will start to split apart. I mean, it's imaginable in the, in the downside scenario that you would have a global economy that, you know, splits apart in the way the world did in the Cold War, you know, with sort of one side doing one thing and another side doing another. And, you know, that's not a very stable world because – Natural resources, for example, which are crucial and have been the the source of you know wars in the past, are not distributed around nicely in the global economy to sort of make that whole structure work. And and so I think the best hope is that that that's not the scenario that will follow. Uh, but you know, there's no guarantees. I mean, we've had countries that became powerful and then and then um, were aggressive in the past. And, and uh, you know, I think the best hope is that, that there's a shared understanding that ultimately that doesn't work, that it's in no country's self-interest to adopt an approach like that. So far, I think we're on the right path. I mean, I, I, my impression, you know, I'd be interested in yours from being in China is that they, they want, they're relatively assertive. They want to be part of the governance structures, but they're not particularly interested, you know, in uh, in in being an aggressive, you know, externally aggressive economic and political power in the future, what they what they want is an ability to protect their own interests. Um, so the military is building up, but you know, it's building up because you know, if the world turned against them, they could get cut off from natural resources, and they still have the memory of the long period in the 19th century in which they uniquely experienced declining, uh, you know, GDP. I mean, it's almost never happened before. So I think a lot of this is, a, is more defensive than aggressive. You know, when we were trying to help out, think through policy priorities that, you know, were relevant to the 12 five-year plan that just got put in place, a group of us, um, you know, one of the main points was that, that, that there's a balancing act, you know, that there's a tendency to think, well, we're still you know, not that rich. The per capita income is about $4,000, maybe a bit more. Um, you know, we'll focus, if so one can imagine people saying, and people do say on the domestic growth and development agenda. And the, and the wise people internally and the wise and sympathetic people externally are saying that's a natural tendency, um, but it's actually not in your interest to do that. They, China has now acquired a very large interest and, and a very large potential impact on the stability and sustainability of the global economy. So the, the thing that's interesting about China is they've acquired this systemic significance because of the size of the population at a much lower level of per capita income than it's ever happened before. And so there isn't really a very good set of historical experiences that tells them how to discharge this responsibility or, that, or to carry out this balancing act. And it's it's been added to the agenda of things they're going to have to experiment and invent as they go along. And probably Japan at certain points in the, in the past 20, 30, 30 years, I guess, came close, but that's a population of 120 million and declining. Right. And, uh, 
and uh, the United States probably fit that description sometime in the latter part of the 19th century when it wasn't fully developed but was pretty was becoming pretty powerful economically but nothing like this I mean this is a country of 1.3 billion people and the interesting thing is India is going to have to go through the same thing I mean they're not quite systemically significant although close uh, but they're Per capita income in India is, you know, a little bit more than $1,500 and rising rapidly. They're about 13, 14 years behind China at high-speed growth rates. But they're not far away from having the same, exactly the same situation uh, that is uh, still relatively modest per capita incomes and enormous size in the global economy. Yeah, I'm amazed at India. I mean, here's a country that's, a, you know, the world's largest and most complex democracy. That, you know, admittedly took some time about it because democracies tend to be like that to find a way, you know, to sort of sustain high growth. And, 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 and you know, in many ways, what you find in China and India are, are, is the same thing. You find very talented people in the private sector and you, and you find leaders who are, you know, admirable, smart, pragmatic and effective and they face the challenges that they have so india finds it harder to build infrastructure because you know it's hard for the government to finance it all but they seem to be finding a way to do it and and but the thing but the thing that made me optimistic about india is i asked a friend who actually is in the party that's in power now the congress party um more on the policy side but nevertheless um, you know, what would happen if you were um, replaced by the opposition and uh, in the next election? And he said nothing. Uh, he said that ne the next group might be do some things differently, but the Indians are convinced that this is the way we're going to go, and they won't allow any party, you know, to derail it in any fundamental sense. And and I think when that, however you get there. Uh, maybe with a combination of leadership and education and experience that's positive and so on, um, when you get to that point, then I think uh, there's a good reason to be optimistic because the fundamental direction is, um, is sustainable. Now in the advanced countries, we have a new set of challenges with respect to inclusiveness and making sure that the global economy as it evolves is, is benefiting everybody in an appropriate way and not hurting people and i and i so i think you know it's a journey and there's challenges all the way along in the journey i think you know a lot of these challenges were dominantly in the developing countries in the past 50 years you know getting things started you know uh connecting with the global economy learning how to manage the macro sort of side of the economy for stability all of these things i think could be chalked up to areas where there's been either a big achievement or at least major progress. Now I think in the advanced countries there's some issues and I'm you know I'm 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 busy studying the German case because I think the Germans the, the German people and their government around the year 2000 were faced a fairly serious and recognized productivity and competitiveness problem. Part of it came from the enormous economic challenge of absor absorbing East Germany back into the unified Germany. Um, but what I think is interesting, and I'm just in the process of understanding, is wh what was the nature of the problem? How did the economy evolve? But, but even more importantly, you know, how did the sort of institutions, the labor, business, government, policymaking, and other institutions function to address this problem because it, it really does look like they've been fairly effective. And once I fin finish that, I think I'll turn my attention to France, at least on the yeah on the advanced country side on uh, on side of things. But uh, you know, so I, I the way I think of it in the context of the book is you know this at this stage, uh, 60 years into this process of of ha sharing the global economy in some real way with the developing world. These are these are some of the new challenges. It doesn't make me pessimistic because I think, you know, our economies are and our countries are pretty well put together in the sense of values and sort of constitutional underpinnings and so on. So we may be pessimistic in the short run because we don't seem to be solving some kind of problem as fast as we ought to be or even recognizing what it is. But 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 ultimately, I think we're probably collectively uh pretty good at addressing them.